Hello, everybody. Um, again, my name is Maximilian Schich. I'm the editor for Cultural Data Analytics, and um, this is the Open Lab seminar. Um, the people you see around me are Kudan Fellows. Um, some of them are online because our group is still not um, uh, combined together because we're either still outside of the country and um, dispersed due to coronavirus. Um, also, um, some um, work from home due to um, staying safe. And um, I also see we have guests, several of them, which are either from the group of Pia Tika or from outside, which is great. Um, our host, uh, our guest today is Pia Tika, who is a professor in uh, and a project leader at the Baltic Film and Media School here at Tallinn University. And um, the idea of today's session is um, a very practical one. First, to get to know each other, in particular what the group of PIA is doing. Um, we already had uh, some long conversations about this. Uh, so I am very, very, very enthusiastic about this. So in general, um, we are operating in the semantic triad where you have cultural products on one end, such as movies. Uh, on the other hand, people talking about it. And in the middle, the cognitive process, which um, we all know uh, brain scientists, cognitive scientists um, have various ways of documenting. And uh, Pia is heavily involved in that triangle doing various forms of research. Um, but of course, I could also spend the first hour of these two hours talking about uh, the fantastic life of Pia, which uh, involves design and uh, work in film, high profile work in film, uh, which I don't. So please uh, check out her profile online and stand back in awe. Um, uh, so far, I would just say I give the stage to Pia and um, yes, Please take it away. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, great to be here with you all uh, online and, and at, the, at the, the Kudan uh, meeting room. Nice to meet you. Um, so um, I will uh, basically uh, try to run this uh, presentation so mm -hmm. that the we, I mean, I have slides, obviously, um, but I will interrupt them at certain points just to uh, open field for question in the middle of the presentation. So, so then we can go back to the slides uh, after your very good uh, and uh, good questions, and then I kind of continue with the slideshow. So I try to because it's it's a it's a uh, slideshow about an hour, so I try to break it into parts so that makes gives also you a uh, possibility to, to uh, ask questions um, okay so um, I will jump to the slides um, I hope that in a zoom I will also then uh, still have everybody's faces with me let's see how this goes Yes, I, I enabled side-by-side -side mode, which allows you to do that. If that doesn't work for you, uh, you can, you have to go to the Zoom preferences and enable it. Then you can see everybody's names, okay. at least, and our faces. <laughs> okay, let's see. So it's, okay. Okay, um, I think I can, I, well, I see you. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, sufficient for me at this point. Um, okay, so um, I um, I took the um, um, I changed a little bit of the of the focus of the of the slides, uh, not drastically, but at least the title. Um, so uh, my pre my first title uh, included an active virtual framework and managing complex uh, narrative systems. But but then uh, after after discussing with uh, with uh, Max, um, I decided that I would focus uh, more on this kind of the triadic epistemology that Max you were referring when you when you uh, introduced me. So um, let's um, start. So um, my background, of course, like um, um, 
I'm a um, senior already, so I have like quite a, quite a wide range of uh, expertise behind me uh, from film, professional film work um, to uh, neuroscience studies, brain studies, um, studying people's uh, brain functions when they uh, view movies. Uh, then currently I'm, I'm focusing more on the theoretical research on uh, uh, human inactive cognition and narrative sense making and the experience. Plus, uh, in, um, applying this to a creative project in um, which I also, which also includes societal and 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 medical applications. Um, I am a project leader. Um, my work is funded by EU Mobilitas Plus uh, top researcher project uh, grant uh, from Estonian Research Council. Okay, so background in, in cinematic, um, I actually noticed, um, okay, maybe, maybe you don't see, I'm, I'm just asking, do you see my uh, US screen sharing sign on, on your screen? No. Oh. Probably not. No, we don't. Okay, okay, good, because it's, it's right on, on top of my titles. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, focusing on uh, so my, my like uh, what I what I try to do is to uh, take my expertise uh, to bring my expertise in cinema cinema and filmmaking and expertise in brain research into uh, implementing that into biofeedback narratives. And uh, the image uh, this image is here of one of the, our recent work with my team, um, uh, State of Darkness a VR installation um, participants. Uh, meeting face to face in virtual reality environment they meet face face to face with the, with the stranger a political prisoner in a prison environment and especially i in this work we focus on co-presence between that screen character and and uh, and the uh, participant uh, while participants uh, um, participants um, uh, psychophysiological um, um, responses are measured and, and that is fed back to the system. Okay, but, but I have a very uh, good, uh, good and enthusiastic team uh, been gathering uh, during the last years. And I just mentioned here um, those that are, are currently uh, working with my project uh, actively. So um, Ellen Lottman is now defending her um, PhD uh, on experimental heuristics of cinematographers. She has been wor working on neurocinematics, especially. Uh, Ermo Sachs uh, is working on cinematic, um, cinematic storytelling in VR and you doing eye tracking experiments. Uh, Robert McNamara, uh, he's working on storytelling uh, with game engines and uh, em emotional response to those avatars um, within that game engine. Abdallah Sham, uh, whose background is robotics, is working in machine learning and data mining and pattern recognition, especially focusing on creating a dyadic, um, a dyadic uh, co presence or modeling dyadic co presence between the human participant and uh, the screen character within a narrative context. And um, now this year started also a cinematographer, uh, Mehmet Yilmaz who is going to do psychophysiological experiments with uh, cinematographic motions. And uh, project researcher is also Valentin Silchenko, who is working with machine learning and emotional speech generation, and, and especially implementing this uh, knowledge on virtual agents and affective, affective computing, uh, using affective computing. Okay, uh, outline of this talk. So, Introduction first, uh, then we go to the theoretical foundations of inactive virtuality. Uh, we talk about tritic epistemology for quite time. We go to examples of uh, implementation of, of these theoretical ideas and conclusions. And then I um, hope to engage you into uh, reflections on, on Kudan project and, and, and what, I, what I presented to you during this this uh, hour. So introduction, the aim, aim, of, aim of the, like the umbrella of the whole, whole project is to try to conceptualize the dynamics of narrative cognition. Uh, background assumptions are that cognition uh, is a, um, 
cognition as sense-making tool takes place through narratives. I mean, cognition and sense-making happens via narratives, stories uh, we tell to ourselves. Uh, so narratives um, are kind, uh, kind of uh, models of context in which uh, we are. Uh, this, uh, this experience is, uh, or narratives are intersubjectively shared and uh, especially we think of narrative experiences, uh, they build on embodiment. I will come to all these uh, points uh, in more detail. So, um, theoretical groundings for inactive virtuality. So, uh, the theoretical groundings, foundations, uh, um, uh, like white, um, but especially when we talk about narratives and experience. So actually, uh, we should in, engage the all disciplines, uh, um, plausible disciplines that have to do with uh, with human experience. Anyway, uh, my uh, focus has been framed by uh, dynamical systems theories, uh, inactive cognitive science, and, and neurophenomenology. So. This, this um, so dynamical systemicity is in the background of all, all the thinking uh, that uh, I'm <laughs> the, through which I, I, um, I uh, work with these topics. And uh, I want to bring forth uh, the pioneering Estonian um, researcher, Jakob uh, from Ilskul. Who, uh, whose biosemis, semiosis, especially introduced uh, like organism and environment, um, the systemic relation with organism and environment, and how they, they consti constitute um, a one whole through this, uh, this uh, feedback loop. Um, se second order cybernetics um, comes into the play, play especially from, from the point of view of, of observing system that observes a system uh, this will be later reflected on my uh, second author authorship uh, concept. Autopoiesis theory is a really important theory uh, and background, uh, which, uh, which uh, then further leads to uh, Francisco Varelas and, and his colleagues' uh, introduction of, uh, of inactive cognitive sciences. So autopoiesis basically describes uh, a system that is capable of defining, reproducing, and maintaining itself. So self-organizing, um, organizing uh, systemicity in, in um, like um, organic world where humans and human minds kind of belong to. So um, all this, all this background is for uh, inactive cognitive sciences uh, emerging uh, or introduced by uh, Varela, Evan Thompson, and uh, Eleanor Roche, 1991, on their book Embodied Mind. And very, very uh, special about this approach uh, in the line of uh, cognitive sciences in general, like if you think of the cognitive sciences background, so mind, mind as a computer, had been a prevailing idea, uh, but inactive cognitive sciences introduced kind of combined cognitive neurosciences, phenomenological inquiry with, uh, with uh, the points to uh, subjective experience or intersubjectivity. And then it, it combined also the holism of Eastern thinking and, and meditation. And all, all these, these, um, these, um, these um, ideas and disciplines in, add, add, in addition to kind of the in the in the in the surrounding uh, existing similar kind of thinking, so uh, this this focuses on the idea of holistic holistic mind uh, and holistic uh, it, um, uh, like um, subject um, fundamentally fundamentally and inseparably intertwined with with uh, the organism uh, with the environment of the organism. Um, 1996, uh, Francisco Varela went ahead and, and introduced neurophenomenology, which was particularly focusing on the idea of, of bringing together the neuroscientific findings and phenomenological inquiries and understanding of the human mind. And um, 
this this uh, this uh, kind of um, background of theoretical the theoretical uh, grounding uh, then um, comes comes uh, into play in in in, in my work. So uh, the theory of inactive mind. So um, this assumes a body-brain world dynamics that is fundamentally intertwined and interdependent. And, and as I said, it, it basically challenges both computational and representational theories of mind. So it also undermines uh, standard positions in the philosophy of mind, such as the idea that mind is identical to the brain. So it brings uh, the body and the world into that systemic uh, combination, body-brain-world dynamics. Um, by the way, um, any questions at this point? No. Um, I have some for later, but let's let's collect a little bit. It's like it's really good. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I kind of uh, um, go through this first section, and and then then we can we can come to questions. So um, so the emer emergence or this emergence of self world relation. So uh, this builds builds uh, or, or it builds on the autopoiesis. So self determination, self organization at the biological level. Uh, very, very uh, important aspect is the temporalization and, and self reference at the level of conscious experience. So this, this relates to narratives and conceptual and narrative construction at the level of intersubjectivity. So basically, we, we have three different layers of, of, uh, of uh, uh, narratives in that sense. We have an autopoetic layer which we can, we can think that that's, that's something uh, that is uh, kind of um, pre, pre-conscious, uh, unconscious, automated level of understanding uh, one's situations in the world. Temporalization and self-references then come into where the, we can say that certain kind of auto-narration auto is born, where you basically already explain for yourself, why you are here or where you came from, why, what, what. so uh, auto that that can be called auto narration. And then at the intersubjective level, we talk about sharing narratives. So we are sharing narratives uh, with uh, with other people, and all these built on 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 self world relation. Narratives uh, work as an explanatory framework for that relation. So, um, NFT mind, um, shortly situated, embodied, extended, especially uh, again building on, on the NFT cognitive science, uh, Varela Thompson Ross, and, and then uh, following, following, um, uh, following um, scholars that have been work, work, working on this field. So, mind is situated. And uh, how narratives correct, 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 correct to, uh, connect to a uh, situated mind is, is that narratives simulate life in its situational complexity. Uh, narratives built on experiential knowledge of physical world. Here in Melancholia, film Melancholia, Life on Trier, you can see uh, that, that all, oh, I mean, in that particular film, uh, the director and his team, they wonderfully played with the idea of that all the physical, physical world kind of uh, starts to uh, behave strangely. So you can imagine rain, uh, rain falling from downwards to upwards, for example, an example of, of playing with that, that um, knowledge of physical world. Uh, and narratives extend uh, to complex intersubjectively shared Social cultural worlds. So narratives and and, uh, and narratives and experiencing narrating cognitive uh, creatures um, are always inter inseparably uh, tied uh, with this uh, shared world and and its um, and the world uh, social cultural world works as as a context. To, to um, 
contextual context to these narratives and and to the experience to the mind and the experience that we are we are studying so um we can we can talk about um an active engagement with the narrative one of my my key focuses so when we talk about dynamics of narrating mind so we've been basically now uh covering up the the dynamics or the theoretical grounding for inactive mind embodiment uh, and now we look at the dynamics of, of, of narrating mind. So um, the core, core of the narrating mind is in sense and meaning making and it has been shown um, this all, all also goes back to philosophical, uh, philosophical uh, speculations and philo philosophical contemplation of the mind and consciousness so we are talking about about long history back to back to uh, written early start of the written history in antiques and the philosophers and 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 that so the arc is really long in in terms of when we think of the narrative mind but uh, so mind can be seen continuously constructing and reconstructing ex explications and, and uh, what is fascinating about mind is also it creates coherence by filling, filling up gaps, even when there is, uh, there is no, no uh, even, uh, I mean, it, it uh, tries to build coherence even from really incoherent situations. So it's really a coherence building tool in that sense also our mind. Uh, and, and it works on, on recycling what one already knows, so the previous experience, in order to be able to anticipate future experience. Uh, it creates non-existing existing ideas and, and it can imagine unimaginable. So if we think of the world, how we, we understand the world, and, uh, and if we think of the world that we can imagine, somewhere in the future, that all uh, emerges from, from human mind um, inside of, which, which we have all <laughs> in, in, inside our heads, <laughs> body brain systems. Okay, anyway, so, uh, so summary of, of, the, of the notion of, uh, of inactive virtuality. So we, we could think that um, inactive virtuality uh, simulates experiences that are as if bodily felt and situations as if lived by. So we are talking about about imagination. Uh, the, with this concept in active virtuality, I also refer to uh, to a, um, a phenomenon that kind of it employs and extends the capability of the human mind to imagine unimagined. And it also goes beyond the technical limitations of what is known as virtual reality, um, augmented reality, mixed reality, and so on. So basically, with the notion of uh, inactive virtuality, we refer to the immense possibilities of, of our imagination and of the mind. So the philosophical... Uh, example is uh, is um, you you can um, you can imagine a unicorn but unicorns do not do not exist in 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 the nature at least nobody has so far found any and uh, and summary summary for the narrative as as a means of sense making so uh, cognition is uh, is all about making sense of the environment and your situatedness in that environment and narrative sense making is a core function of human cognition. And behind the story told to others, there must be, all, be first a story that you tell to, to yourself. I think this, this would be a good point to um, take some questions. I'm just thinking how do I, sh yeah. So far, uh, 
Yes, let's, let's take a round of questions. I, I have some, but I would like to encourage everybody else to go first. <laughs> um, so who wants to go first? Uh, if you're online, just unmute yourself. And then if you're in the room, just speak up. If there's nobody speaking, I gonna speak a little bit. <laughs> so, um, Sander wants to. Sander? You raised the hand. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Sander. Yes. Ah, hello. Uh, hello, again, Pia. Um, this, uh, I mean, right now it's, uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll ask some question. Uh, uh, okay, so wait, uh, kind of rambling. So my point is, uh, the, the entire concept is very, uh, very interesting. And um, especially like last, uh, one of the last sentences you right now mentioned that uh, uh, there is a, an, uh, like an unfathomable basically amount of different uh, ways, or um, if I say it correctly, I guess like the sense making mechanism can, um, can formulate a story uh behind this i mean uh, is there is there in general for let's say um the way people generate stories in their head about some topic or or some target uh, is there any kind of mathematical models for this uh, employed or thought about or developed or is this mostly uh devoid of let's say uh, like a mathematical framework um, very interesting question. Thank you, Sander. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually, I'm, uh, I know that there's a, like, a math, there, there are groups that do mathematical model, modeling of, of narratives. Uh, but then uh, if, we, if, we, um, if we focus on, on the emergent moments in the mind when narratives emerge, so uh, within the that subjective uh, idiosyncratic private experience. So um, we do not have uh, direct access uh, to that. To, so I, I don't know if there are mathematical models. Actually, I would uh, love to hear about mathematical models uh, relating to, um, to this. Uh, of course, like, uh, like uh, Francisco, Francisco Varela, work um, he has been uh, and um, colleagues they have they have uh, uh, quite interesting um, modelings of, of uh, neural neural on the neural level in terms of, of how, how brain functions uh, in terms of uh, like let's say in terms of temporality for example but um, I cannot I cannot give you any any reply to that? I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess I, I meant more specifically like uh, the concept of, uh, let's say, a story itself. That, that would there be any way to kind of compartmentalize it to different components? But, but I, I, I thought that maybe this is a bit too uh, wide of a question right away. So maybe later we can discuss or something. Because it, it brought me this idea because you were discussing in general about uh, the formation of stories and then the, uh, this kind of conversion from person to person. I guess the narrative is the main uh, term in the term to use in this case right uh, so it's like is there any way to formulate what is a narrative as a, as a mathematical object so so how to work on that but i'm not entirely sure if maybe that's maybe that's too uh, high high uh, class of a function to define I, uh, maybe I can chip in. So I think that's actually a question which is I am very happy that this comes up in this uh, discussion because it's right at the intersection between uh, what Pia just lined out and Kudan in essence, right? So if you do cultural data analytics, cult data as such is stuff that comes in digital form, whatever. So, so even if it's like sort of stupid, just an enumeration of zeros and ones in an OCR page, or the RGB values of pixels, it's, you, you already have some kind of mathematical form. And then the key question is, obviously, what's a narrative? Is it, a, is it as you walk through a text or is it an assembly of texts that, you know, like your Twitter stream, for example? And then the key question when we say mathematical function takes us back to last week's discussion, where, uh, which was sort of also about the fact that um, a mathematical concept would implies probably you want to have a better mathematical concept than just stupidly sort of scanning the text right or like representing it as zeros and ones on the on the surface of a dvd or something like that and so that means 
can we come up with a better understanding in a mathematical fashion? And I think that is a really, really interesting question, which um, <laughs> there's, there's an interesting there's side note, like P and I have been discussing also with her partner, Maori, uh, who's also a cognitive scientist, and um, he's sort of like covering another aspect there, which is super relevant, which is, you know, what, what is actually cognitive representation? And so, so both, both questions are sort of like related with each other. And I'm not answering the question on purpose, but um, my rambling sort of hope lines at a kind of playing field in which we could do a lot of um, collaboration. And, and that includes some people who are in neither group, but, but are interested in this. I think this is something really interesting, I think. Yes, it, it, it very much it very much depends, uh, as, as you, Max, said, how you define narrative. So mm -hmm. um, in, in this presentation, I define narrative almost as a synonym for cognition. So it's a, it's a really wide, uh, wide uh, definition of narrative. Then we can, we can uh, kind of frame it down to uh, different, uh, different uh, like um, shared um, narratives or textual narratives. We can, we can uh, kind of frame it down um, to very, very uh, tightly defined uh, uh, definition of, of narrative, for example, um, in lit literary sense or, or telling, telling a joke, let's say. <laughs> telling a joke. Uh, that, that's where I would like to bring in one of my questions, no, actually. Uh, Sorry. Who's there? Sorry. Uh, that, that's where I'd like to bring in one of my questions. Uh, actually, um, while you were talking, I had this idea of how about, you know, if, if you talk about narrative, people immediately think about like people telling stories, like reading from a book or, you know, something like that. Well, a narrative can be nonlinear, right? It can be like sorting out the mess in your kitchen or sorting out the ideas of cognitive science <laughs> to write a book, uh, which may technically not be uh, uh, where you go from one point in time to another point in time and then you have told the story, but it may be something that involves like ordering, say, a two-dimensional um, field of things and stuff like that. So, so how, do you, how do you deal with that, that people probably always have this misunderstanding that narrative is a kind of linear thing when you talk about it, so. Yes, yes, uh, this is of course like um, um, the narrative possibilities is nonlinear. Mm -hmm. In that sense that, that, uh, that the mind uh, can generate um, I mean, mind is a complex system, <laughs> and so it has complex connections to all kind of things in, in terms of also in terms of neural functions. So associations, uh, habits, um, kind of a wide range of, of experiential knowledge that have been uh, ha has made you as you as a subject, mm -hmm. a, a person who uh, can imagine things. So if we if we if we think of think of the the so there's a, there's a, in some sense, when we talk about narratives, we, we uh, kind of, uh, there are ad infinitum of possibilities, but at the end, in, in ter terms of in temporal sense, uh, there are choices made, which kind of create the narrative that you walk through. So Francisco Varela has this saying of that path, path, is, is created by walking. So this could be a good uh, explanation of, of, or good definition for narrative in, in terms of how I understand it. Mm -hmm. So it's created by walking, but each step you take, your environment changes. Like uh, we, we can think of the landscape metaphor in this case, walking through the, to, through the landscape. Mm -hmm. Every step gives you a different perspective to the world around, the complex world around you. And it all kind of uh, is a continuous uh, uh, interaction with ev every step that you make in terms of the history of the path that you already walked and the path that you can anticipate you will be walking. 
but you don't see too far. That's, that's also like something that is our human mind. We don't see too far. Um, we can see maybe, and depending on our cognitive structure, we can see to a certain, and uh, or anticipate to, um, to a certain extent, but not for, for, uh, for eternity. I mean, mm -hmm. not for, uh, so, um, so, uh, but, uh, but uh, actually uh, we have discussed, uh, we have, we, uh, I mean, we have a, uh, created a model of, of narrative nowness, which is a mathematical model uh, for uh, narrative nowness. And I, I, can, I can come back to, back to that uh, in the, in, um, in um, later in discussions. So um, yeah, maybe, maybe that would be, uh, yes. any other questions, uh, I'll just jump back to the screen. Anybody else? No? <laughs> okay. Maybe you should just continue your talk, I guess. Yes, yes. Um, so we are here. And um, here. Okay, so so uh, we went uh, through uh, interesting points in the, in the of, of narratives, uh, especially uh, this aspect of mathematical modeling of of a narrative construction. How mind my how we can mathematically model narrative uh, thinking is is a very very good good point, and 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 we can come back to that again maybe at the at the end of the talk. Mm -hmm. So uh, what what you referred to. Uh, you um, refer to my micro microphone is on. I hope. <laughs> so, um, so um, what you refer to, you also refer to this nonlinear way of the world, world builds and and like cleaning up the kitchen, like what to do first and what. It, so um, I, I worked uh, already in my uh, doctoral thesis, uh, two thousand eight or two thousand eight. I defended, but I, I worked actually for eight years with my doctoral thesis, which means that I created an. An, an interactive uh, cinematic installation uh, for years, and, and then another three years, I then formulated the theoretical inactive cinema, the theoretical um, um, formulation of the inactive cinema. So, uh, inactive feedback loop is very crucial in this dynamical systemicity that we, we are talking about between the subject, subject and the environment, or subject with the, and with the narrative systems. Um, and an inactive feedback loop is kind of a dynamic two-way adaptation uh, between narrative and human experience. So this is an example of of of, uh, of inactive loop, a feedback loop between a narrative system on the screen and and viewer perceiving that, where the viewer's physiological uh, responses are measured. They are and they are fed into the. Uh, the montas machine in this case, which basically uses a uh, database um, database to select uh, the next next uh, best uh, suitable um, image uh, this is this image is from my op obsession two thousand and five obsession uh, an active cinema installation obsession um, that was part of my my thesis work. Um, what what I have been carrying with me is 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 the since the 2008 uh, work is um, the this um, cybernetic uh, approach to uh, authorship. So this is a traditional way of thinking of of the authorship that there's a narrative content that authorship manipulates and manages and then it's kind of sent to the human experience um, in in um, uh, one way one-way manner. Uh, second order authorship, which is very dear concept for me, in, uh, on the other hand, um, is, is describes a situation where you have a complex human experience interacting with, an, with, an, uh, with a narrative system that is adaptive. So there's an inaction between uh, the human experience, human and then the narrative system. And second order authorship refers to this uh, managing of such a system from, uh, from top, basically, um, basically uh, a complex system, a human, human mind or, or authorship is, is managing two complex systems, 
human experience is to, to a great extent uh, unpredictable. We can predict uh, some, some aspect of the human, human experience based on our knowledge of psychology, uh, neurosci neurosciences, and, and, and so on and so on. We can assume a certain behavior for this uh, human and how he or she exper experiences the narrative system. But it's still, to a great extent, let's say, unpredictable. And then we have a narrative system, which, is, uh, which we author as, an author, uh, as well. In, in terms of what kind of material we have, how that system works and so on. But when we go to the narrative systems that are, are generative and when they, they um, have like, um, uh, when they approach uh, what, what uh, I like to work with, which is, which is uh, self-organizing narrative systems, then we have a, two, two relatively complex systems in, in action with one another. We, we, what, and, and which the authorship kind of tries to somehow manage or control. So it, it, um, when we start to talk about the nonlinear narratives, then the complexity increases uh, almost exponentially. And, and uh, this type of systems um, are what, what interest me. And, uh, and, and you, can, you can also, you, you can also, uh, Kind of um, well, this this fo forms um, kind of a um, model or models uh, such such a situation where uh, you are uh, trying to control uh, system are in interaction with, with one another. So um, so triadic epistemology is is a kind of a Okay, triad, it builds on triangulation. So uh, with the triadic epistemology, uh, I, I, I try to define uh, or somehow take a hold of the complexity of the human or inactive mind. If we think of that, if we think of that, that um, human mind environment system. So uh, triangulation, uh, we can, we can, we can think of the Persian, Persian uh, three-corner triangle, for example. So it allows a multidisciplinary inquiry to human experience. You will find out how <laughs> later. Uh, and it allows uh, like uh, describing uh, the nature of human cognition in a context relative manner. And it also assumes continuously looping feedback and cross-references between different disciplines. Okay, uh, I, I acknowledge that this slide came a little bit too early. Uh, in, in terms of, of, the, of the complexity of topics uh, it listed. But, uh, but we, we can take kind of the Persian or pragmatist um, um, assumption or, or setting where um, there are three different uh, domains of knowledge and two domains of knowledge uh, uh, are kind of um, interpreted from the third angle. So two domains, a um, binary uh, situation uh, with two different uh, domains cannot really uh, explain each other in, in, in a, a sufficient manner, but you need a, you need a third person, third uh, corner or third, uh, third corner, third uh, perspective. You need a perspective outside of those two disciplines that allows you to actually interpret uh, the relation between the, the two, two corners. So um, per Persian uh, semiotic triangle, um, I don't go into this uh, here in, in more detail, but, but basically the idea is that, um, that two different, two uh, corners of the triangle, two um, aspects of, of the triangle being that object uh, and representant of that object are interpreted uh, from a certain context, a certain angle. Um, closer, closer, even closer than to, to my uh, own thinking and, and, and actually also grounding um, basic uh, foundation of, uh, of understanding for also for inactive cognitive sciences is Ulrich Neisser's uh, perceptual cycle. So, um, going kind of uh, 
uh, beyond the J.J. Gibson's uh, action, action per perception loop, so direct perception and affordances from the environment um, kind of uh, intrigue uh, or elicit in the subject certain kind of certain kind of behavior in relation to that. But uh, but in Uri Nicer uh, expanded that to taking uh, taking account into to the constructive nature of, of cognition. So you basically you basically have a have a schema of uh, that is kind of a schema that directs your exploration in the environment where you find stuff of that defines an object that then um, then modifies your schema. So creating this uh, this cognitive uh, cognitive uh, feedback loop between an em environment and and um, uh, phenomena within the environment and the cognitive cognitive uh, subject. Then uh, then uh, Maturanas and Varela's autopoiesis uh, builds on the on the uh, or takes inspiration for from the organic world and actually from molecular and cell, cellular uh, uh, organisms. In, in that sense that, that, um, that in, in this system, the system has boundaries, but, this, but these boundaries have holes through which kind of input and output uh, and interaction with the environment functions. But within the system, it's a, it's a self-sustaining system and self-organizing system. So within the system itself, uh, it, it kind of generates a metabolic reaction network, which produces mole molecular components, and uh, which then determines the system. So uh, this type of uh, that type of um, feedback loop within uh, within uh, the most simplest uh, um, cell cells, for example, um, can then be expanded to the to the human mind to. Uh, organisms to uh, to also to um, social uh, in social organizations and the social world um, and especially Umberto Maturana went this path uh, while while Varela uh, was has been more focused on, on on defining and understanding the consciousness consciousness and a human subjective uh, first-person experience. So these two guys, uh, since this uh, describing autopoiesis, they kind of took took a different path. Both both interesting paths. But again, the systemic nature of of that this organism is is uh, inseparably em embedded with the environment. So context and the subject cannot be separated. So um, how I how I was thinking that I would I would go through this uh, this um, tragic epistemology and how how uh, I see it uh, how uh, as as a theory how it can from theoretical point of view how it can be uh, kind of applied to uh, neuroscientific studies and studies of uh, human behavior when interacting with with narrative content so um i will i will proceed um to uh, to these these uh, points now so holistic understanding of experience um holistic understanding of uh, experience uh kind of uh, can be un uh, 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 can be defined for example in terms of three different the three different data, uh, so the data collected from psychophysiological observations, so data collected from neural neuro, neuroscientific studies, psychophysiological studies, mainly such data that the subject is not in control of, directly in control of, cannot cannot manipulate that data. Then we have subjective reports where uh, the person uh, person describes. How I felt, how how uh, uh, what what aspect, uh, where did I feel emotions? So subjective reports of that experience, and and then we have a context description which relates to the actual, uh, which is annotation of the content within which this experience has 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 taken place and and and, and emerged. 
So um, the triangulation as, as a method here, we, we can, we can uh, so all this data that uh, I listed, uh, and, uh, so subjective reports uh, and, and data measured from physiology and, and then the content annotations, they are to some extent un, un, incommensurable in, in terms of that there's a qualitative data, textual, all, all kind of forms of data that is produced to describe that phenomena from different angles. Uh, so key here is that the temporal synchronization of, of these experiences, especially when we talk about, uh, for example, experience that has, has, a, has a duration. So that's, that's a key. So uh, in, in terms of, um, and, and, and inherited this, uh, this question from my neurocinematic studies, where, uh, where we were showing people uh, very complex narratives uh, and uh, we measured uh, brain data and physiological data, very, very complex uh, data, big, big data in terms of, of, the, of the long durational film and, and, uh, and a lot of happening in the human brain and human body. But, but what was very much missing uh, in, in terms of, of uh, putting funding in and, and putting effort in and a work labor was uh, in, in, in a kind of a narrative content annotation very much uh, was, was, uh, uh, has been uh, kind of uh, insufficient and then uh, annotation of the subjective experience. Because these parts are really, uh, collection is also very uh, data labor, very uh, time consuming and, and, and uh, requires a lot, a lot of analysis work as you all data analysts know. <laughs> so uh, data is, is requires quite a lot of time and expertise. So analyzing data, physiological data, uh, but, uh, but uh, what, what my point is that it's not sufficient to have this well con con constituted um, um, kind of a well uh, analyzed. Uh, it shows me your, uh, your connection is a little bit un unstable. I hope you hear me well. We do, we do hear you, yes. Okay, okay, okay thanks. So, okay, so you got my point. So um, in, in order to uh, sufficiently <laughs> to apply methodological triangulation in, in sufficient manner, uh, each corner needs, uh, needs um, uh, equal amount of, of focus in, in, in terms of a study object. So narrative annotations uh, can, can be, I mean, there's automated annotations, now referring to, uh, again, to neurocinematic studies, um, as, as my examples, uh, anno uh, automated annotation tools uh, exist, uh, then there are uh, ways to uh, do uh, manual annotation on different aspects of, of, the, of the audiovisual material. So narrative content annotation, uh, it exp I mean, there's huge amount of uh, uh, possibilities to apply to narrative content annotation. I just have these two examples of uh, automated and manual annotation of the content. But, but uh, who annotates and, and from what point of view? So uh, it's a, there's a, like a warning on, from that corner of the triangle that expert annotations may not correspond to subjective experiences. And, and so also the expert annotations, um, it as all the other annotations as well, it requires selecting from what point, point and which aspects are annotated and so on. So then we talk about the corner of annotation of subjective experience. So, okay, here again, subjective experience uh, is uh, subjectively biased. The reports are subjectively biased. So uh, psychology, of course, and social sciences have many ways to try to avoid and, and kind of detect these biases. Uh, but, but basically, basically um, what is, uh, what is uh, interesting about um, kind of uh, the subjective reports uh, or uh, uh, to, even though uh, subjective reports are to a great extent kind of referred to um, or seen as uh, private and non-shareable shareable, um, experiences. But um, what, what the, the, the recent, recent uh, neuroscientific findings 
have, have been able to point out is that, that actually there's uh, quite a big range of, uh, of intersubjectively shared aspects when, when considering, considering uh, any phenomena in the world. So, in other words, we people do share to a greater extent uh, than we are maybe even willing to admit. We like to think that we are in individuals, um, but we do share because of our, our biological, biological background and because of, uh, of uh, our cultural, sociocultural background we share. So um, this uh, particular e experiment here, it's not uh, my experiment, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, conducted by uh, Lauri Numema and colleagues, uh, my, my, um, my neuroscience college in Aalto, colleagues in Aalto University. And uh, it, it, it quite, it's a quite an interesting study because uh, in, in this study, um, they, it's a web-based study. So um, people all around the world basically could uh, go into the web, uh, into the internet, and to this web page. And with the mouse, they could uh, color uh, any part of the of the body of, of this this character in in, in uh, regarding, for example, here sadness. Uh, that which body parts do you feel that are most active, uh, most strongly experiencing sadness? And you color that figure, and then which body parts you feel that do are uh, like losing strength or are not. Uh, Oh, actually, actually, they come. They, this, why do I say this? They say, please color the regions whose activity becomes weaker, slower. Please color re regions whose activity becomes stronger and faster. So, put put um, put uh, this way, and uh, so people do this in, in this individually in their homes. But what found out is that even in emotions, which are so um, so personal, in, in some sense, uh, intersubject correlation could be discovered. And here we are talking about, uh, about um, people even across uh, cultural, uh, even across cultural, uh, culturally different uh, or distinct uh, areas. Um, Lauri Numema and his, his colleagues, they went on, on doing more of these studies and expanding this to more and uh, more, um, more cultures and so on. But, but the result is same, that it, it, to some extent, certain bodily experiences are depicted or, or kind of understood in, in a similar, similar manner when you kind of translate them from your bodily feeling to this image. So now we are, we are talking about simulation in, in, in that sense, the simulation of your own bodily, bodily feelings uh, uh, drawn on these um, puppets. What you, everybody, every one of you, you may now uh, try to uh, pick up uh, like any, if you, if you take, for example, okay, <laughs> what would it, love is very strong, we don't take love, we take uh, like uh, pride, for example, and, and you look at that figure, and even only by looking at that figure, you can actually feel that, that those uh, senses in your own body, at least to some extent, you can imagine feeling those senses in your body. So uh, this is what, what I find interesting is that uh, not only uh, textual or conceptual um, aspects uh, like narrated uh, stuff is, is uh, shareable, but also bodily, bodily uh, feelings and experiences are the critics shareable. Okay, so um, I took quite a, quite a time to explain that, but it's related just to, to, just to emphasize that subjective uh, experiences are always, uh, to some extent, intersubjectively shared between people because we are all humans, just because of the biological and biocultural background. And physiological measurements as annotation. So, as, as I said, so this is, this is where uh, most of the most of the money and, and efforts is put, it, put in, in uh, all the fields uh, uh, in, in, in neurosciences and, and in 
psychology um, because um, well the data is is uh, such a wonderful resource of findings um, so in, in uh, neuroscientific studies, uh, especially like uh, we've been collecting uh, psychophysiological measures and, and then functional brain imaging is uh, especially functional magnetic resonance imaging is a tool that I, I've been using and that's why I use that as, as a reference here for the examples. So this is a Aki Kaurismäki film, Mats Vätteri Girl. And uh, it's one of the very early neuroscience studies that we did. The orange areas are the areas that are intersubjectively shared. And, and gray areas are areas that don't synchronize. If you think that there's something between us, you are mistaken. Nothing could touch me less than your attachment. Would be best if you would go away. So what happens in a human brain, in many brains, is that this rude behavior and the simulation of, of that that um, emotional and situation, emotionally loaded, rude situation, creates uh, this kind of effect in, in, the, in the several brains. Now, here we have had 12 viewers. So um, it's really fascinating to be able to get from the brain such, uh, such data uh, in, in uh, dense in the voxels, uh, small voxels in millimeters, uh, such data where you can argue that, that uh, for some reason, when viewing this scene, individual people experience this in similar way. And now then the question is, why? What was there? So the interpretation part is of the data is always the most difficult part. And, and uh, as I said, so warning, just, it's just data lacks interpretative reference. So um, what can we say about that data if we just look at the data alone? So um, basically uh, this means that, that, that in order to kind of have access or have an interpretative angle to, to those, uh, those uh, different aspects, uh, for example, here for subjective experience, how the subject experiences the narrative content can be kind of interpreted through the physiological measurements uh, or, or physiological measurements are mapped, um, are mapped to subjective experiences against a uh, particular narrative context. So there's always uh, the, the yellow corner in these, these images is the interpretative angle, the angle that actually gives you the perspective and uh, descriptive uh, tools to access those, those, um, those um, two other uh, data, the relation of those two other data. Uh, Next, uh, next, um, I will go to, uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, I may not be able to go through all the examples, uh, depending on you, but maybe I can also break now. Uh, or um, you just tell yes. me. Yeah. I think it's a very good time for questions. Um, okay. Okay. So. So if I understand this right, the, the last thing you've shown, the last two slides in essence is the, um, is sort of the um, foundation of your approach, right? Because you get this data set bias, if you only look at uh, film or if you only look at uh, the uh, physio, uh, psychophysiological kind of measurements like fMRI, MEG or whatever, or if you only look at the experience or look at like, 
you know, film critics, you could say, are, are basically like documents of experience, right? Like if you look at only one corner, you obviously get a huge bias. So therefore you look, need to look at all three in order to compare them with each other. In data science, um, cultural analytics, more broadly, digital humanities, where we only work with data, quote unquote, only, um, we typically get around this by looking at multiple different data sets, which should be independent from each other and show the same effect, right? So it's an interesting thing, but I think the approach of like covering the three corners is really, really interesting. Um, so, but maybe we should um, fork it out and, and ask questions from the audience. And so um, maybe now we have collected more. So please don't, don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not really familiar with uh, film, so the question might be a bit silly, but... Uh, who are you? <laughs> Tell me first, who are you? Your name? Oh, I, I'm Hannah. Hannah, okay. Yeah, um, I'm quite far from film studies, so uh, uh, maybe a, like a basic question um, about the terms in active cinema, and then affect theory uh, that I've also heard. Um, is there a relation or are they like qualitatively completely different? Um, are you asking if inactive is qualitatively, attribute of inactive uh, defines qualitatively differently the phenomenal studies than affective? Uh, kind of, yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, we can say that uh, they are related. Uh, so affective, uh, the notion of affective actually, um, um, so there, like, there are different approaches to, uh, for example, um, for cognition. So there are uh, approaches where uh, like um, co so-called cognitive cognition and affective cognition is separated. This is, for example, where uh, affective, affective notion comes into play. It, it refers to the idea that, that there are like affective uh, layers or emotional unconscious uh, conscious layers in, in human mind that have a kind of uh, their own domain that affects the experience and behavior of the, of the, of the, of the person. Uh, now it depends on, on, on how you uh, define the affective in terms of that cognitive aspect of the, of the, of the, the co cognitive side of cognitive cognition, which is kind of a conscious knowing, consciously interacting uh, against uh, affectively feeling and affectively interacting, for example. So it very much goes back to emotion theories that which emotion theory you choose as your grounding so in inactive, inactive approach, uh, in emotions and uh, let's say affective uh, affect, affects are understood as a basic grounding of the conscious, conscious uh, behavior and, 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 and a kind of cognition in terms of how we understand it. Uh, uh, so it's built on the affect, affective uh, experience experiences and affective uh, automated way of being in the world. Uh, uh, but if you, if you choose the, the other, other uh, approach, then like we can radically say there's two, I mean, two different approaches. The other one puts like emotional or affective line parallel with, with, uh, with uh, cognition, cognit cognitive cognition. So in that sense, uh, they are seen as two separate but uh, somehow intertwining ways of making sense of the world. So what I would say is that in, in an active approach, affect and emotion or emotions are the grounding of the whole experience and how it builds up. While in, in there's the other, other approach where you have two parallel lines and, and which is very, very much uh, used, for example, in uh, neuroeconomics. So econ em economic studies like to talk about emotions separately from cognition. So I don't know, did, did this re 
answer to your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me. Let me in general say there is no silly questions and there is no stupid questions because we all live in different corners of the universe. They can so, be really stupid, stupid replies though. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, we, uh, let's find these corners and like, then uh, figure out how we can solve them. Mark. Uh, hello, I'm Mark. Uh, so I'm, I'm from Humanity uh, so, so the studies you, you showed, so there was like neural, uh, uh, sort of this neural reference of uh, uh, interpretation of some uh, uh, were basically uh, neural changes, all right, which were like depicted in there. But I was wondering that have you tried or have you uh, have, would, would you how would you comment? Are there like sort of depictions of the uh, changes of this neural site, but also correlated to sort of cultural changes? I mean, in the in the sense that uh, let's say that you will have the same uh, depiction of emotions from different era and it's depicted differently based on the era and how it would then reflect on the neural uh, reaction or something as such. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so uh, just to repeat, uh, I, I didn't understand, so uh, era, so are you referring to different cultural uh, periods or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Let's say that you have like same, uh, uh, so let's say you have like similar narrative, or right? Like story of hero or something. And it's like, it's depicted in like different uh, years or different cultures, but the basic narrative is the, is the same. That have you made such comparative studies? Okay, uh, no, no. So uh, yes, this is it's a good question. And, and, uh, and to say about that's a defense, for neuroscientific studies, especially when, when dealing with uh, narratives. So uh, narratives only recently, like it's, it's less than 20 years that the neuroscientific studies have been able to uh, use longer narratives, long durational narratives uh, in, in neuroscience studies. And, and very much uh, the work has been delayed uh, due to, uh, we, we've, we were first forced to develop the, the data analysis methods. Secondly, we, were, we had to wait for the measurement tools to get better, that we could measure more data. And then I had to wait for, um, for the computer power to increase sufficiently in, in, to bring all these computerizing related aspects to a higher level of, of, of uh, function so that actually we could start to look at the questions that are like important from, from a humanist point of view. So uh, when, um, so what I learned is that, that uh, in, in, in neuroscientific studies, um, the steps are very small. So you have to always just take one step built on whatever has been understood so far. So you cannot make big leaps. So, for example, uh, looking at the cultural differences, it's one of the key questions that people always ask because that's, that's what interests people. How, how do cultural differences show? Uh, how do uh, different, like, uh, how, how, do, how do this, this type of differences show in the brain data? Uh, you can study cultural differences, which has been done. Uh, I have not done. But uh, there are studies that look at the cultural differences between, for example, emotion. For example, Asian people have been shown to uh, relate more to we word, while Western people have been shown to relate more I word. So that already tells something about cultural differences. Mother and myself in Asia is a different thing than mother, mother in, in Western, thing, Western world. So this type of cultural differences has been studied, uh, kind, of, kind of range depending, depending on uh, groups. But the point, point that uh, I wanted to see, say is that, um, yes, these can be studied, but um, in neuroscience studies, you always have to frame your, your research question in so tight manner that 
that in order to be able to get some kind of uh, knowledge and some kind of, that kind of data out of that you can actually interpret it based on your research question. So um, that's why what I'm saying that this type of steps are really small in neuroscience currently, but but uh, but the field is expanding. So it's young. So um, so um, this this is why why it has mainly been focusing on data, collecting data, <laughs> less on analyzing, uh, less on on uh, on uh, f focusing on uh, putting same effort on the content or the so. But uh, yeah, I can I can come to up and tell tell about the experiments that uh, I've conducted. So, for example, the, actually I will be doing it the next next uh, next session. So, uh, all this uh, what follows. So, uh, maybe maybe you can then uh, ask me again based on based on those uh, examples. Nice. So, Sander raises his hand. Please just speak up. Oh, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, so, I um, uh, wanted to quickly just check on you. Uh, um, I had this idea, of, for instance, uh, if you present, let's say you present a narrative, some sort of um, video clip, for example, and um, you record uh, what is happening, let's say, in fMRI. Um, so, there is, of course, many uh, relationships to explore here, but I was wondering specifically, is there any work done or anything possible to do in this way of... Um, estimating or measuring or somehow recording, defining uh, acceptance or processing of that narrative. For instance, um, let's say you show a political ad and then uh, you will uh, gauge or gauge the reaction to this ad and maybe uh, in applying something like, uh, like this, uh, what was this heterogeneity of thinking by Vygotsky uh, and others, um, is it possible to make some more connections between narrative, the specific processing step in this triune uh, mechanism, and uh, well, yeah, essentially, uh, this was this this the triangle mechanism where there was this processing step of accepting a narrative and this auto uh, poesis, auto poesis, right? So maybe is it possible to examine that part specifically by targeting some sort of narratives and getting some reactional response from it? Has, has something like this been done or could it be done? Um, could be done and, and uh, has been done. Um, but once again, uh, the research, uh, research question has to be really uh, targeted um, in, in terms of, of, for example, of political ads. So uh, you can you can for example uh, create an ad where you add uh, red apple into the table. <laughs> Otherwise, it's exactly the same same political ad. <laughs> it's just an it's just ad hoc. And 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 uh, and then you can compare how differently people responded when they had the red apple on the table and when they did not have the red apple on the table. So this is what I mean, like, uh, that uh, in these um, uh, yes, 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 that makes sense. experiments need to be really, really uh, careful. But, but then, of course, uh, then it comes to all the contextual aspects of what is apple, like, okay, it can come to Bible, Bible, <laughs> Bible, uh, like, um, you know, apple of plausible evil, evil uh, act or or um, is it a uh, fruit of, of uh, life or you know anyway so um, we can we can talk about this uh, these questions more uh, after I've, I've shown the next uh, next uh, because because I go to uh, I ex explain a couple of my experiments so maybe maybe that helps a little bit. yes so uh, let's take one last question before we go to the experiment phase who wants to speak yes Vayune. Um, hi, Pia. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Veyun. I'm a part of Kudan uh, team uh, today from home. Um, I'm very inter interested in working with gender and I work with movie industry a lot, but mostly on the distribution and exhibition side, never really the reception side. So your work is very interesting for me because you obviously capture the reactions of audiences and of course with the verification um, of um, the brain activity. Um, and we just discussed a couple of experiments that you had, and I understand that it has to be very simple questions. So I was wondering if it's, for example, possible to, let's say, have uh, the same message delivered um, 
either in a narrative context or even in a news context uh, by a man and a woman um, and then check, uh, let's say, reactions and maybe you have done some sort of work uh, with gender already. Yeah, that's something I was wondering. Um, yeah. such, a, such a comparative uh, setup would be most fruitful in terms of the data analysis, as said, because, because uh, there are tools for comparing this data and that data in terms of the synchron synchronization uh, in time. But um, yes, uh, this, would, this would be um, a good example of, of studying uh, gender differences. Uh, so, yeah. And, and, uh, and such, uh, such uh, studies have been conducted where especially, with specifically focus on gender differences. Um, generally, uh, then you may have, uh, or, or if you, have not, you are not aware of this, uh, uh, crit critical approach to uh, neuroscience papers. Um, so there's, a, there's a, this particular paper, which I cannot recall the authors currently now, but by Googling, you will find out if you, if you Google the content. So basically, there's a, there's a critical point in, in the, based on the fact that most of the brain data, most of the papers that have been uh, uh, published are uh, mainly explaining or, or mainly referring to the brain, brains of uh, white uh, male, uh, males from 22 to 28 years old uh, from quite, um, econ quite a good economical background because a lot of these studies are conducted in the Western world, in the expensive universities, uh, technology universities in the States, and also this is the case also in, in uh, so um, <laughs> we have a lot to do there, I have to say, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, gender balance and ethnic balance. So, uh, yes. There's, uh, you, you mentioned this paper by uh, Nunenma uh, with the, you know, where people could paint into the body like their feelings. There is a, a art project by Fernanda Vegas and Martin Wattenberg, or not Google, where they sort of repeated the experiment uh, for the missing part in the paper, which is uh, erogenous zones. And you get huge gender differences for obvious reasons, but not only in the primary. Um, um, uh, there, was a, there was a network. Network difference, uh, network problem. Uh, so I, I lost your question. But okay, did you so, find? Yes. <laughs> so there is a there is an art project that was followed up on the paper you uh, showed the slides of with the uh, highlights of particular feelings in the body, uh, which is done by Fernanda Vegas and Martin Wattenberg, uh, who are now at Google. Uh, so the project is called Flash Map, and so it maps the erogenous zones of male and females. Um, and the gender differences for obvious reasons are very large, um, but not only in the areas of the body that are sort of primary character characteristics, but also in, 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 you know, like ears and head have completely different maps in essence. And so that is really interesting because it actually points to the fact that there's a lot of stuff uh, one could actually study. And I think what's also interesting to study is actually, because we're talking about these really blurry heat maps, uh, and um, yes, there is a kind of average, but uh, blurry heat maps are always something we should look at the confusion too, because there is probably huge differences between, I don't know, between me and Arnold Schwarzenegger or... <laughs> right? so, um, I think that is, a, that is an interesting thing to, to, to take a look into. And, and I think we, that's sort of something we should actually go after. And, I would like to make one observation before you start with your experiments, which I find really interesting. So we are in Estonia, right? And so you root your approach sort of in Uxkill and uh, there is, there, there's a kind of philosophy which sort of lends itself to being here. So we're, we're in this corner of the world for a reason in essence. But um, the other thing that's really interesting is you, uh, you root your uh, approach also in Varela and Maturana and you have lived several years in Rio de Janeiro, which is also probably not a coincidence. And so beyond like the fact that in American universities, many studies are done with white males uh, between 20 and 28, 50% of which are fundamentalist Christian, 
um, maybe you can speak a little bit about like your broader footprint of your background because typically there is there's a lot of Latin American scholarship, not only Varela Maturana, which everybody in the West knows, but also a larger background that is sort of typically not looked at from the West and from the North, while um, vice versa, they are fully aware of what's going on in the US and in Europe, for example. So, so, so maybe you could speak a little bit about like how your approach comes together and brings in all these different experiences, including film design and whatever, because you have a really rich background that is sort of encouraging for people in the room, because we have some of, some of us are artists, some of us have been in completely different disciplines, in essence, and so there's value to that. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, um, I um, don't exactly know which which footprint you mean. Uh, mm -hmm. You mean my big foot <laughs> that I no, 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 I mean the, standing um, in the theoretical groundings or my little footsteps that where I've been. I mean, typically you 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 you, you very um, um, uh, sort of inspiringly inspiringly uh, walked across this landscape of triads, right? Where. Uh, yes. Semiotics, uh, researchers from semiotics would uh, name Saunders Pierce, but you also are familiar with the neuroscience version of it, the Varela Maturana version of it, the, um, the, um, yes. the yes. kind of metabolic version of it, and so on. So I think that, that, that is something which is not very usual, but it's actually super valuable in essence. If that makes sense. Well, well, that that comes to comes uh, from the from the kind of a multidisciplinary background that I have, uh, first of all. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but uh, not only that, I mean, I have kind of some kind of expertise from uh, advertising, working in advertising, graphic design, uh, concept design, then, uh, then in, in a film, film world, like really like um, brain, Amazon rainforest, working with Indians and, uh, and or um, Philadelphian uh, prison for a fiction film. So um, there's a certain kind of uh, background there, including my own films. So two long feature films and then interactive or inactive uh, cinematic uh, works. But, uh, but uh, then um, this, uh, this kind of comes, uh, comes back to uh, my research in, in, uh, for my doctoral thesis. <laughs> Uh, I worked with uh, uh, the Sergei Eisenstein's Russian film film director and, and theorist Sergei Eisenstein and his his uh, uh, scientific backgrounds. And Sergei Eisenstein was, uh, in addition to being one of the most <laughs> most uh, acknowledged uh, filmmakers in the world uh, and pioneering, but he was also a very eclectic uh, researcher. So he <laughs> wanted to know everything about everything what was taken. <laughs> In his in his contemporary sciences, so uh, so for example, uh, Alexander Bogdanov's uh, like systemic theories from uh, from uh, turn of the century, um, Berta Laffy, Gestalt theorists, um, uh, Ernst Cassirer's work. Uh, so so. Uh, he was kind of an example for me what you as a filmmaker can actually do and, and, and how you can actually um, explore the world beyond your own discipline. So this is what, what I'm telling to everybody, uh, to my students also, is that, that uh, if you're a filmmaker, if you, you're, you are working in a film field, don't stay in the film field film field, like you can, you can stand at the edge of that film field area, but look outside. Look what others are doing in other disciplines and try to think how, how these, uh, these uh, models that they use, how these concepts that they use, how they translate to your own work. And so this preaching uh, different disciplines has been my, my like, key of everything I've been doing. And that's also what led me to, uh, to uh, the neuroscience project. So I was invited to write the research uh, application uh, for this um, five year, uh, very big project. And as a, fil as a filmmaker and, and that's, that's with neuroscientists and, and that's uh, kind of allowed me to then step, 
to, to this other science, science domain, even though I was only filmmaker, which was like, like, or artist, but, but, you know, it's like, uh, so I moved to, to the neuroscience field with, uh, with very modest, uh, modest, uh, like I went there to learn. So, uh, you know, the, that, um, humble learner, a school girl again. So that was how I, I, I went to sciences. But yes, uh, so... Um, Thank you very much. This is great. Yeah. I mean, this is... Um, yes, this, this, this kind of uh, thing which uh, to be interested in many, many things, I think is something that is super inspiring. And then in, in university, we're often, often not, we're, we're, no, we're told not to do it, right? Because like you have to be a specialist, you have to be an expert, you have to write like an art historian. If you're an art historian, you have to do research like a psychologist. If you're a psychologist, then you have to be a filmmaker and you ask somebody else about something else. But I think that is super important. And, and, and I think a, a great kind of, uh, I don't know, it's just, this, you know, the, I think this being interesting in everything is, is sort of a, a good way to, to sort of a good basis of, of hanging out together and like being interested in even more things. Yeah, uh, yes. that's, that's why I, I want to talk to you guys because, uh, because um, also now I can go actually to my, my uh, experiments and then we can start. Yes. Kind of, uh, Thank uh, you very much. Talk around. Uh, around uh, so we're on. Okay, so um, so um, these are just a couple of examples uh, due to the time frame uh, that uh, that uh, I I want to show you. So examples of implementation of, of. so uh, uh, one of the studies I, I did uh, in in neurocinematics was um, uh, showing uh, people in a brain scanner uh, the experimental film by Maya Deren from 1944. And this is just an uh, example of, of the film. So it's a silent black and white film. So uh, one, of, one of the questions uh, I got interested from this particular film was the embodiment. You can guess why <laughs> I thought that this is a quite a good, uh, good film to, uh, to uh, kind of study if people simulate and the uh, characters embodied uh, actions on the screen if they somehow simulate that in their motor, sensory motor brain systems. So um, I'm not going to go into detail with this particular uh, studies as such, but I'm just saying that, that okay, for example, in this study, we, what we did, uh, I had a, a film editor uh, annotating the whole film based on the bodily aspects, aspects of the, as well as cinematographic uh, aspects of, of that film, especially fo focusing on the bodily, bodily aspects, so hand uh, movements, uh, feet, and, and so on and so on. So we, um, we annotated the whole, uh, whole timeline. And, and the next thing what we did, we um, projected those annotations uh, against the, the data that we had been collected. And we, we used here especially independent component analysis so we basically um, tra track to identify those uh, brain regions or brain networks that that uh, related to certain certain bodily bodily uh, aspects. Uh, so you can see that uh, that uh, that there are numbers of the these are the numbers of the components here in the in the down. Uh, so a certain 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 components were prominent for, for and showed uh, correlation and, and then uh, which, which uh, aspects of that, that uh, kind of which features they, they uh, specially uh, correlated with can be shown in this, in this color scale. So uh, red being the most uh, like warmest, strongest uh, correlation. Uh, so there was also camera movements and and uh, and uh, like wide frame, medium frame, close-ups, 
and then body, bodily, bodily uh, parts, how they were presented, and also, also actions. Uh, however, the, 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 uh, in this particular study, uh, it, it were, I mean, there were areas, like we were particularly looking at the way if there are like mirror, mirroring uh, networks were, were uh, acti activated in, uh, strongly. So we had that, but, uh, but uh, not uh, specifically strongly, especially that, that uh, mirror, ne mirror neuron uh, network. So uh, once again, the complexity of, of a film is, uh, and the associations that people, each person kind of uh, connects to that film, um, it's, it's, immense, it's immense, and, and, and that this is just the one way to try to, try to frame down what aspects we can actually look from such a complex system. Okay, but uh, Memento, Memento film, uh, so this is, this is an experiment on Christopher Nolan's film Memento. Uh, when I was watching the film um, in, in my personal life, I realized that the, that film has actually uh, moments. It's a, it's a story about a guy who has, uh, has uh, been in a violent incident where he has lost his uh, short-term memory. So he basically uh, cannot remember what he did two minutes ago. Um, and he's trying to find out who is the murderer of, murder of, of uh, his wife. But, uh, but the film, what's interesting in the film is that it's structured so that it, it, go, go, it kind of backs up from last scene uh, of, the, of the chronological order to, um, to the first scene. So it, it kind of, it's told, the story is told in, in uh, in reversed order with scenes. And, and I realized that there are moments, uh, several moments um, where um, a certain image that has been seen before in the folding or uh, unfolding of the narrative repeated exactly as it is. And when you see the second time the same image, you realize that, ah, what I saw before and, and, uh, and this scene, they actually belong together and you bring them, them together. And uh, this is just a, there's no sound in this uh, clip. Mm. So, uh, do you, there's, do you have to uh, share computer audio down below? And, uh... No, no, this, this uh, does not have a sound. The clip oh, okay. is, is okay. in this clip. So uh, this clip, this scene where the guy jumps uh, in front and, and, uh, and uh, this is where, where I started this. So basically, uh, basically this uh, clip, when you see the clip for the second time, you realize that, uh, okay, these scenes actually belong together and in your mind you reconstruct the story again by bringing these together. So what I wanted to capture is the moment of narrative reconstruction. And you can, you can so there were 15 scenes, like 15 images like this. And, and so we did a bit, uh, did, uh, collected the data and, and did several control studies um, in, in terms of, of the of the particular moment, uh, particular brain patterns emerging during this second showing of, of the image in 15 different images. And, and what we could, uh, could, could uh, detect was kind of a brain network that we can argue that kind of uh, relates to continuous sense making and reconstruction of the narrative situation at that moment. And, and we can assume that the same function uh, also takes place in, in maybe in everyday social context when you rethink or you have to re, uh, reorganize your mind in relation to something. What, what, what was special about this particular uh, uh, study that Mement of Film allowed us to do is that uh, 
this kind of narrative reconstruction happens all the time in our, I mean, it, it continuously our mind updates and, and, and makes uh, anticipations and, and continuously our mind reconstructs constructs our situatedness. But, but all the people in different people's minds, this happens in, in different uh, phase. Some people are fast to get it, some people are slow to get it, uh, and some people don't get it at all. So um, it's, it's very difficult to find uh, synchronization or intersubject uh, correlation between uh, across different viewers when, when there is no clear time windows that you can look and you can argue that here something must happen that, gonna, you know, something must happen in each of the viewers' brain. And this was the, this was the, the kind of uh, idea of, um, or queen idea of this particular, particular uh, work. Uh, and and this, was, this was also uh, a, our paper that got wide media, media coverage due to, uh, due to uh, thanks to Memento, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, so we captured, uh, captured um, uh, neural fingerprint of what we can argue is reconstruction or cued memorizing of, of um, in the brain. And, and then we, we have a content, content analysis so that, uh, that we can, we can uh, look at the narrative, uh, narrative content of an annotated narrative content of that, that particular film. But then uh, we are still missing the third corner, which is the, the subjective experience within those, those uh, points. And so uh, what, what, what is ongoing is a follow-up study where uh, one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Jelena Rosik, is doing a micro-analysis interview, interview analysis study uh, on people who watch Memento film and then they reflect on those points. But this is, uh, this is uh, conducted then using a different group than actually saw the film. But anyway, so we're trying to fill up that gap that is, is missing in this triangle here. Um, mm -hmm. So here is what is conducted and, and, and what is next steps. So next step is, is really to uh, look, at the, look at the subjective uh, descriptions of, of the experiences people have during those moments. And, and also we are interviewing uh, film experts and editors to also to give us uh, more, more understanding of, of those, those narrative, un the unfolding of, of the stories. And, and then the third case uh, I'm, I'm going to show you is, is the, uh, more related to uh, now uh, with the virtual characters and, and what I'm, I'm mainly focusing with, with my team is, is uh, building this um, and studying these face-to-face -face meetings with, uh, with the human, human participant and, and then the virtual uh, human-like uh, characters. And, and so, uh, for example, this study, uh, the booth, uh, where uh, we have two different uh, uh, virtual uh, screen characters um, based on based on actually scanning of uh, 3D photographic scanning of actors. So uh, we have two different uh, characters who have uh, life stories. They tell their life their story of how they where they were, how they left their country, why they were forced to leave, what happened on the trip, what, uh, when they arrived, and and what are their plans. So this very structured story that both of them tell, but they are slightly different stories, but construct the same way. And, and then we um, are putting the participant into the position where they need to kind of make the decision based on, on the story and the character if they accept or reject the asylum seeker. Uh, I have to say that we've done a, a pilot study with, with a small group of people and most of them accept uh, both of these guys. <laughs> so. Uh, so uh, mm, there, there is um, definitely uh, not uh, not like a discriminative bias there in terms of, of their, their decisions. But so uh, 
this, uh, this study also relates to what uh, Robert, uh, I think Robert is also joining us here on, on, the, on the meeting. So Robert is, has started his PhD study now. So we are particularly with Robert, we particularly focus on, on, on the implementation and aspects of, of, uh, of virtual characters at the border control, control systems. But then uh, Robert is developing uh, cinematic narratives in game engines where uh, two characters walk these paths and, and then at the end the viewer has to make the decision. So it's kind of a, a more uh, developed uh, version with the, with the contextual aspects uh, connected to that. And, and here we have done uh, physiological measures and then uh, subjective ratings like, like asking about um, background um, understanding or opinions about uh, refugees. And then there's a content annotation where there are two different stories that are uh, structured in similar way, but they are slightly modified. So, so the other one is a journalist and lecturer in university, and the other one is a medical doctor and human rights activist. So this type of um, background uh, changes, uh, modifications. Uh, so conclusion. So narrative experience described using a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach. Uh, so there's an epistemological background, so this interdisciplinary triangulation for, for knowledge accumulation, then methodology, uh, annotation, annotating in time, uh, in time, um, in order to synchronize different, different, uh, different data with one another, um, and uh, application to, to any context. And so an active mind is a dynamical system of body, brain, and the world. And an active virtual is the way to describe the world creating mind. And uh, epistemic triangulation suggested as a means of translating the theoretical concept uh, to practice. So, um, reflections on good, and then I'm just asking that <laughs> we, Max, you already a little bit touched this, so I'm asking what are the corners of. Uh, could and triangle and relation between these different different aspects. Uh, I also have this this uh, kind of mapped that uh, cultural is kind of a context that evolved as complex social systems. So it's a narrative content, the context. Then data. Okay, data is quantitative and qualitative measures. Um, analysis has to be something to do with the human meaning making formulated as narrative interpretations or some kind of narrative explica expli explications. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you very much. Let's, let's all thank the speaker before we discuss more so we have time to Um, yeah, maybe I should uh, I, I should should add one word to the to to how you ended. Um, this obviously ties into the discussion we had um, the two of us, um, and I think that's that there, there's a there's a really interesting resemblance going on, which may be not as clear as as people in cultural data analytics uh, may think. So. Indeed, we look at culture, which is sort of our movie, um, but we only can look at it through documents, which is data. Um, but there is there's always some cognitive process going on, A, between whatever shaped the data, so between culture and the data, and there is also a cognitive process going on in our perception of the data, which, by the way, is part of culture. We are part of culture. So there's a really interesting kind of conundrum or complex system itself going on. We are part of the world and we're looking at the world at the same time. And so there is, uh, I think there is no coincidence that there is sort of a, you know, sort of a kind of 
resemblance going on and sort of like our, our, our mutual understanding uh, of the world because we basically go back to very similar ideas, right? So this, um, um, it took me very long to figure out how closely I'm uh, sort of standing on the shoulders of Ernst Kassira and he on Leibniz. Um, and so there's, there's a really interesting thing going on where in the 20s, in the 1920s, people were much more aware of these kind of overlaps and we almost overcame the trench between the humanities and the uh, sciences. Which, by the way, is another interesting thing. It's not only Chinese and Europeans, it's also multidisciplinary scientists react differently to the V word than humanists do, who react more to the I word. And they, they think it's an insult when you say, we did blah, 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 because they think you, we, we sort of um, are pretentious, um, because they, they just don't take into account the fact that every paper is written by five people, in essence, in the end. And so, that is something that's also parallel between two, our two projects, I think. And so, um, again, I have, I have a whole number of questions and uh, we could probably talk for a couple of weeks, but I would like to like spin it out into the round. Uh, <laughs> what about like to, three years? <laughs> yeah, exactly, or three years, exactly. We have three years minimum to go in the same building, which is cool. Um, we got about 10 minutes to, to go, and so I think um, it would be great if people in the room could ask um, their questions. And it's exactly about the silly questions, because uh, we need to get them out the door so we actually can have a, a less silly conversation, in essence. So, who wants to go? Mar was switching on the camera. Oh, um, the universe is actually lifting her hand. Yes. Yes, I can go. Um, hi. Um, so again, I was looking at the brain maps um, when you were showing the experiments you did. Let's say people are watching a film and the brain slides up. Um, and I was just wondering how can, like, basically, how can be sure about the causality there? Uh, because maybe the brain lights up because I got an itch or that I remembered something I forgot to pick up from home in the morning rather than the actual film I'm watching. I was wondering how you dealt with those things. Well, it's, it's a kind of a problem and challenge of, of, of data sci sciences in general. So in this case, it's, um, it's uh, the statistical analysis in terms of the similarity of the responses. So if, if you got itch in your body, then it's, it's maybe not these areas that activate, but it's, it's your uh, itchy itchy brain part, <laughs> a brain region that is responsible for, uh, for correlating to or responding to itching. So um, even though, let's say, let's say this way that, uh, that there's a lot of happening in people's brains while they, they watch, uh, watch films. So that's what I tried to say is that, that it doesn't mean that they, they are completely in synchrony because, because uh, they have different backgrounds, even though, uh, the groups that are selected for are always always kind of uh, they are uh, framed down to as homogeneous as possible. So same age group, um, same uh, background, in order to statistically create uh, data that that would be uh, would not have um, too much uh, variance in in terms of, of, of the of the parameters that that constitute the data. So, um, but even even though if it, because each person is different, so they they will have different moments of thinking of that. But uh, but uh, what this this uh, method allows to capture is those moments when they are in synchrony. So there's a lot of stuff happening also elsewhere in the brain, but uh, it only captures those aspects of different viewers' brains that are in are in temporal synchrony with one another in terms of spatial spatial uh, sp spatial also re resolution in terms of brain regions within which uh, these activities uh, take place. So um, yes, it's it's all going on there simultaneously. So uh, it's a good question, um, um, but it very much falls into once again to research question and then the the 
design of the of the experiment so that it really can focus on that particular issue. But the point is that all these uh, movie movie uh, studies that um, I have been conducting, they are all explorative studies. So we are using a blind data analysis. So in, in that sense, we collect all the brain data that we can get. And then we have a certain, certain uh, okay, in, in the case of Memento, we had, had uh, certain time moments that we looked at how, what we could find. But we basically, uh, we, so all my studies have been uh, explorative blind data, data, using blind data. Analyze. Could you maybe just explain what blind data would mean here? Yeah, well, it, uh, it means in this case, it means that we don't uh, we don't uh, define regions of interest. We don't say that we only look at uh, sensory motor areas. We look at the whole brain, and then uh, then this is this is a, this is like a good example of of, of so explorative. Data data approach means that we collect all the data that takes place everywhere in the brain during, for example, memento as 105 minutes, so three sessions of 35 seconds. Every moment in the brain is is uh, recorded from all the people, and then we start to throw the that data on the table a million times and see what kind of patterns emerge. I think there is a there is actually a discussion to be had. There's also almost something we could actually start a working group on that. Um, this question of causality, right, which is naturally uh, coming out of uh, studies that do statistics, where we would do some linear regressions or whatever, or we have some Bayesian model of what's actually going on, where you know you assume you have some anticipation. Because the last three times you crossed the street, um, no car came when it was red. So you walk across red and then you killed. But there is this other form, what, what I assume is meant with blind data analysis, which is like astronomy. You stare into the sky and you don't know what's happening, what's cause and effect. But you first just look at like, OK, what are the temporal patterns? What is the synchronization? What, what is the, the alignment? Like, you know, if you look at the your bra's clocks on the on the on the wall where you figure out oh they start to synchronize but uh, you know in this particular case yeah it's just quite simple the wall is the coupling right so that's the reason they they they, they synchronize up which still doesn't mean you understand why it is happening but in in a complex situation this is not quite so clear and like if you complex contagion as air as for example diseases spread over the airline network there's, it's really hard to figure out the concentric wave that's really going on. So, um, so you, if, you, if you run like sort of, if you don't look at the system blindly, quote unquote, you will never ever get closer to the, to the whole thing. Because if you just say, oh, okay, I got airports and then I got another airport and then I say um, disease spreads from here to there, I do a scatter plot of source and target airport and then I fit some line. The, you will never get to the causality of the contagion and how it works out in a complex manner across the system, not only point to point and, and, and sort of in the correlation of two, two axes. I think that is one of the key issues. There's a major difference between what's happening in, say, evolutionary psychology and statistics and economics and um, more standard stat sociology and complex system science, which is traditionally, and for good reason, very reluctant to actually even get to the point of causation. That, that's also the reason why there's a difference between cultural data analytics and cultural evolution, by the way, because uh, cultural analytics would be something like saying, oh, yeah, let's, let's look at the data we have, and selection and variation may be one mechanism of cultural uh, dynamics, but there may be other things going on. We don't know, right? So we just need to look at the data first. And I, I hope this makes sense for both of you. But I, I wouldn't say, oh, I do this different thing or I do this different thing. I think the interesting thing is really to how can we sort of build a common approach and then figure out when, we sh when should we use classic statistics where maybe we can even do a linear regression. And on the other hand, how do we actually 
maybe get closer to causality in a world where that looks messy and almost like you're in a cumulus cloud in essence, right? Does it make sense? <laughs> yes, 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 it does. Uh, so uh, in, in some sense, I, I don't know if it makes sense for you to, to think about, uh, think about um, like, uh, okay, uh, I've been showing you examples of uh, whole brain data collection. So there's a huge amount of, we can say with this voxels that are three dimensional cubes and, and within these voxels there are certain kind of uh, things happening depending on which region they relate to and what are next to, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, neurons are next to it and so on and so on. So could we imagine that, uh, could we somehow see a correlation between uh, like this brain data <laughs> and the uh, cultural uh, data in, in terms of, in terms of, um, uh, yeah, um, the, the, yeah. We, we, we don't need to coarse grain as much. Like on the one hand, our data is much more bounded. On the other hand, we don't need to cut the world into voxels, um, which what macroeconomics has done, right? I mean, literally they use the same methods as brain science to cluster their zip codes of the US census. Well, now we can actually work on basically the individual level and you have temporal resolution. Of course, like in astronomy, like if you look at Instagram pictures, for example, we do not get a continuous sampling that's neatly bound in space. So you have to deal with methods that are much like in astronomy dealing at like really shabby intervals, irregular intervals of observation. I think that is a really interesting problem we have which I do think that brain science in the end has too, actually, if, we, if, if, if you're yes. really honest about it. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, and especially when you start to deal with, uh, with actu actually really uh, temporal events that unfold mm -hmm. in time. And, and, and this is, by the way, something I wanted to refer to. Um, we had a paper, paper where we, uh, Sander was asking about the ma mathematical models. So I'll, I'll just quickly shift to this one, just to show you um, just the title and, and, and uh, mm. Okay. So, uh, so model narrative nowness uh, or neurocinematic experiment. This is where we try to <laughs> kind of, uh, kind of um, leaning on, on the, Francisco Varela's ideas, uh, but which are actually going back to William James and Husserl's ideas of time consciousness, kind of to define the nowness, but but to mathematical model model of that nowness. So uh, we uh, we kind of built the model math mathematical model for the uh, retenti, re retention retention, which is like looking backwards and, and trying to see how uh, how events. Uh, previously happen, happened events uh, that we assume a decay time when they kind of die out and, and uh, what point of that, uh, that uh, timeline we need to kind of uh, renew that queue in order to keep it, uh, keep it in, the, in the memory, memory frame of, of the human. So already this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, dynamical causality causalities um, form <laughs> huge uh, challenges for for uh, for when we start to consider things that evolve in time and in each step they change. That's super super interesting. Um, unfortunately, we run out of time. Um, I, I, this is something which is um, actually, uh, as everybody attended NetSci one and a half weeks ago. Um, most of the network models you, 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 you have seen, they build on things like barabasi albert model, which are growing network models. But obviously the second model that came out after barabasi albert model was a model by Sid Redner, which not only had preferential attachment, but also preferential forgetting uh, of nodes. And I think that is something which is quite curious, like as historians, this is the first thing we think about. Um, and as, you know, we're dealing even within the narrative of a movie, that's also something we think about. But in the, the natural scientists less naturally think about something like that because they just see the exponential growth and everything 
in the world can be seen as a deviation from that exponential growth. But I think there's a really interesting thing where we have a lot to bring to the table uh, as we are um, producing art, movies, texts, um, study history over time, look at how people perceive the world. So that's a really interesting kind of, uh, I think a really interesting last kind of example to, to see, yeah, this is actually, such models probably have to come out of us and will probably not naturally appear in the physics department, if that makes sense. So thank you very much. Um, next week, a uh, little preview. Let's thank Pia again. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for and having me. I hope everybody will join again next week where we will have Simon Gale from Carnegie Mellon University, who is an astrophysicist doing cultural data analytics. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I think he's probably not even calling himself an astrophysicist anymore, but that doesn't matter. Um, thank you very much. Something from mind to the space. And, and I just want to end the, 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 by saying that, uh, that uh, it, amongst the, the brain, science, brain scientists, we have the saying that the, that the space, uh, space uh, is a kind of, uh, that the brain is much more complex place than space. <laughs> In the space. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yes. Um, anyway. But that's our own assumption as humans, isn't it? Uh, because we haven't found the other brains in space. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> space is the place, and even if it's a brain. Yes, esoteric topics. Okay, yes. thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.